Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Thank you for coming to yet another episode. Very excited about today's show. I've got a special one for you. Somebody I've recently been introduced to. I have been voraciously <laughs> reading the books and it seems impossible. I wouldn't have known before and I have a feeling many of you have known about this individual and the two people about to come on, plus the being that comes through one of them. Have you ever heard of Cryon? Well, today I'm speaking with a former audio engineer who today speaks to audiences worldwide. It is Lee Carroll, who channels the being known as Cryon. And here also is the amazing Monica Moranyi, who is the skilled researcher and archivist of the Cryon material. Welcome back to Dare to Dream. The show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. We just won in Denver the Coalition for Visionary Resources Award for the best radio and podcast show and are currently featured in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. If you are on a spiritual path, this is the place for you. Welcome home. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. If you'd like to take a course or become a facilitator, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a media visibility specialist. I'm a book writing coach. I also have a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the heavy lifting. And the final leg is I show you, my spiritual messengers, how to be interviewed on radio and podcast and get massive results. I've got a free gift for you so you can start to learn how to do these and increase your visibility, which, ahum, is exactly why you came here to be the light. Go to debbie-shinger.com slash gift, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. Indeed, my guests today are Lee Carroll and Monica Moranyi, who work together to share the messages and teachings of Cryon's wisdom. Lee's relationship with Cryon began in 1989, when he experienced a profound loving energy that awakened him to an understanding that God was bigger than anything he had ever been told. Since then, Lee has produced 14 Cryon books and co-authored three Indigo Children books, which introduced the world to the term Indigo Children. And as the original channel for Cryon and a service to humanity, the Delphi Metaphysical University awarded Lee an honorary doctorate degree of science, transpersonal psychology, and metaphysics. In addition, Lee has been listed as one of the 100 most spiritually influential living people by the prestigious Watkins Mind, Body, Spirit magazine. In 2012, Monica began her journey with Lee when she launched her first published book, The Gaia Effect, and then published three more subject-driven books from the collection of Cryon Channels. In her books, Monica posed dozens of questions to Cryon that provided greater understandings and new realizations. Their partnership to the Cryon work has resulted in the creation of three beautifully illustrated Oracle card decks, two Cryon smart apps, and a weekly online gathering of old souls who participate in the Healing Wednesday program. You can learn more by going to cryonmasters.com. That's K-R-Y-O-N masters.com. And with that, I welcome Monica and Lee to Dare to Dream. It's so amazing to have you. We feel Whoa. so blessed. What an introduction. I actually want to just sit and listen to you continue me, talking. Me too. I mean, interviewed. not because you have our bios, just because we love to hear you talk. By the way, we haven't won any awards. So, <laughs> 
So we're in such great company we with you. We are. So, yes. I love Jimmy. And congratulations Pinochet. for being a big light on this planet. It's and so And what neat. you are doing, reaching so many people and getting noticed for it. So this is awesome. This is a, a part of everything we teach is possible. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It truly feels like my calling, my piece of the puzzle here on earth is to shine a light on folks like you and make that connection for others. And as I shared with you before we started, it was, I think it was a client that I was doing a Zoom with and mentioned your name and how into you she was. And immediately I Googled and looked you up and I, I just felt so much resonance. I reached out immediately and I was so grateful to your team for being so receptive. So here you are and it feels like kismet. It feels like this was meant to be, this connection. I, I agree. In fact, and even before you interview me or, or Monica, I'll say there is a connection starting uh, with mm -hmm. people like you and people like um, so, so many who haven't really been in the weird niche, which I can get to <laughs> later. I've been doing this for so long now, it's shocking to me to see what has been predicted about this time and seeing it happen, seeing it happen with you, seeing it happen with others, where you're discovering things that, as I would say, are, have never been in our niche before. So we're seeing mm -hmm. an expansion, not just of our work, but of, of the awareness of so many about themselves. I love that answer. Can you just illuminate a couple of the predictions that came quite some time ago that you are now seeing unfold? You know, if people had asked me uh, what I'm about or what crime's about uh, 10 years ago, I would have had a different answer. Mm -hmm. Now I know what this is about, and specifically the predictions that have been made all along. In fact, since I even started, is there's a shift coming on the planet. It, I didn't even know that this prediction was also a prediction from many indigenous as well. As we start mm -hmm. studying and going around the world, it's very, very similar. Uh, let's say an awakening, uh, an awareness that um, you can call it anything you want to of um, integrity. Uh, of, it, it's not religious. It's, it's people being more aware of who they are. Perhaps they're um, feeling different, a little different about the creative source, what you call God. And today I'm seeing this shift. So this is one of the biggest predictions that has been here ever since I started. It's coming. It's coming. And what was coming so was, you know, uh, when I started, there was going to be the year 2000. It was going to be the Armageddon. If you studied your Bible, it was going to be all of these horror things and uh, the end of the world. Well, it sailed by. And that was the first thing that Crian said in book number one in 1993. And he said, there will be no Armageddon. And there wasn't. And back then, it was almost hearsay to say that because everybody was so invested in it. We were going to have World War III and all that. So here we are sitting in that first prediction that has come true. And there's, there's others, but that, that's the basic answer. Amazing, yes. And I hope more to come. I like how positive always his message is, how well we're going to do. Just hang in there. We're here for a purpose. That's meaningful. And so I want to get to the two of you, Lee and Monica, working together as a joint mission to share the messages and teachings of Cryon. And a question for each of you. Let's start with you, Monica. Who is Cryon to you? I think I was first introduced to Cryon when I was at a moment in my life that began my journey. I had my husband leave me. I was wanting to have kids. My mother and father-in-law passed away all within a very short space of time. I would never be even wanting to consider looking at life from a different perspective if those things didn't happen. And so here I was broken hearted as a ranger in the national parks in Australia. And I started this journey that unfolded. And I, in that journey of trying to discover who I was and how this tragedy of my life had happened, I'd moved to New Zealand. And in my very first yoga class in New Zealand, someone handed me a book and it was a cryon book. And 
when I started reading this book, the cells of my body was just vibrating so much. And in particular, there was a chapter in there from a lady, Peggy Phoenix Dubro, who was teaching energy work. And I just knew that I had to do this energy work. And when I would read Cryon, the information would just be hitting a chord of resonance of remembrance mm. more than it was just information because we listen to information all day every day we are in a information technological era and when you have some information that comes through with such purity that goes into you at the cellular structure with that resonance of home and that as you said every message from cryon has been here to empower the human and messages of hope that is the closest way i can describe the energy of cryon and it's very difficult because we want to put one entity or one spirit being but cryon has always said i'm neither masculine nor feminine I am a group, I am an entourage. And so this is something very difficult for us to understand as the linear human being who sees one face in the mirror, one body. We want to have that one experience and yet we are told from Cryon that our soul, the bigger you, the real you, it's a soup of souls connected to everything and everyone. And that's a very difficult concept to understand. But bottom line, Cryon is here to help guide us through the most amazing evolution that humanity has yet seen. That, and that, that's who Cryon is. Awesome, beautiful. Do you miss the park ranger outfit at all? The four that <laughs> you had to wear? Well, I've got some pictures if you want. <laughs> I do not miss it at all. In fact, I've gone the opposite where I like, I get to wear girl clothes and jewelry and I, I totally embrace that aspect of me now. For well, sure. you're beautiful. So. <laughs> Thank you. And how about you, Lee? Who is Cry? No, Cryon calls you his partner. Mm. Who is Cryon to you? everything um mm. the there was a time when it was separated uh, when i first started the experience was like uh, well there, i'll just tell you there's one time when crying talks to me constantly and and said about 10 to 15 years into the adventure and that was halfway through he said stop playing church <clears throat> and i said wait a minute what does that mean and he said well he said, you, um, you go to a place where you're going to channel and the people show up or you go someplace and the people show up and they show up and you channel and, and, and then you put me in the closet. <laughs> and I said, uh, kind of. And he said, it's time to meld. Mm. He said, I want you to become everything you teach. Oh my so gosh. the meld started to happen. And that was what really changed my life. And it's interesting to see how long it took for that as an engineer as a very linear man, not interested in anything metaphysical, uh, making fun of new age people. It took me that long to unlearn everything that I was, I was told. And so that was, I guess, the first time. So Cryon then became not just a friend, but the way of all things. It's like an angel sitting inside me that I could go to anytime I wanted to. It was also frustrating because um, part of what we learn is, uh, well, I'm gonna, you're going to ask God for this or that, whatever. And I'm realizing it doesn't work that way. I mean, so many times I go to Crying and say, what do I do now? And Crying would say, well, you know you're dearly loved. And I'd say, I didn't ask that. And, and it would go for that way for, until I had reached the, 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 the pinnacle point if I had to do something. And finally, the answer was there. And I would say, I would say, thank you for the answer. And, and everything turned out right. But why didn't you tell me before? And he said, because you weren't there yet. That was one of the biggest principles I ever learned is that we have choice in our lives. And when something's coming, we don't understand. We have to wait 
until right up to the point it happens because of all the variables and that's when the when the when the answers come and the joy comes and the it's it's just beautiful and i got used to not worrying about what's coming mhm and that's so amazing. yeah and so to answer your question uh, crying yeah. is um a- anything you want to say uh that would represent it's not a father it's not a mother it's not god it's become an oversoul for me mm okay because well, let me ask this first why is cryon called of magnetic service what is magnetic service okay that that particular answer took me years to understand and we've had a, even episodes on our show about it a uh, special video on it very difficult to ha- give you in a sound bite but basically his first information was that the magnetic grid of the planet was going to shift that's that's the compass where you can move you can see north change and it did it changed more in 10 years than it had in 100. Mm-hmm. We wind all the way now to find out to the, through a Princeton University and HeartMath that consciousness is actually related to the magnetic grid in ways that are techni- uh, technology proven and there. So now we understand that what Krein was going to has said is you're going to eventually receive proof that consciousness is energy. Mm-hmm. And that proof is going to come through physics seeing it and we did we needed that particular thing to to know that if consciousness is energy that means it is a player in physics it starts to explain why consciousness is necessary and can move things and and as a as a player in actionable items it's not just something mamby pamby that floats around you know what what kind of consciousness it does it's it's energy that's it, it took all this time to go there. So there's the magnetic connection. There's more there, but I, that's not necessarily why we came. Okay. And if Cryon has never been human and he is a collective and a non male, non female, what energetic form is he? What is he exactly and why you? And the answer is yes. And I just gave you a multi dimensional answer that makes no sense in linearity. Um, how can God listen to a million people talk at the same time? Mm. The, these are the kinds of things. And, and, mm. and Krein is, is continually answering me with that answer when I ask those kinds of linear questions. Um, there, there's a lot more here than meets the eye. So what part of that question do you want me to address first? Why you? I have asked that repeatedly. And Krein said, because you, you agreed to it before you came in. He said you were prepared for it the last lifetime. He said, it's why you came. And then he told me, because you have free choice, if you had not done it, uh, there would have been someone else. So it's it's not necessarily what we think. It's not a linear kind of a thing. You know, when this happened to me, I was in my mid-40s. And when you're in your mid-40s, you pretty well got life figured out. And I did. And I knew who I was. I was in a profession that was successful. I didn't want to change. There was nothing I needed. (laughs) So this was not born out of need. And instead, something else happened. And if you want to, I'll give you that. But in all of that, this was not expected. So it took me a long time. When he said, because you chose it, I said, well, why did you wait until I was in my mid-40s, you know, and I was winding down life instead of winding up life, as as we're taught happens. And he said, because this is when you're the... You, this is when you're ready, when you're done having kids, when you're done doing this, when you're settled and you don't need it, and when you're paying attention. And that made sense finally to me. But there's all kinds of linear things that we're taught and think of that had to go out the window on this. Yeah. Deb, have you ever had a sense if you are cryon in another dimension, multidimensionally, past or current lives? Both of you, by the way. This is yeah, I've, I've never had that question because I know better. I've seen what in my own personal life, I've seen who, what Cryon is, and it's, uh, it's too magnificent to have ever been a human, and that's why it's not a bit. It's like angelic um, energy. It's huge, and it's so, so incredibly loving, compassionate, kind, understanding. Um, I know it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And also, I wanted to just add, if I can, that 
there are others that channel cry on mm -hmm. and Lee was the very first one to say let's get everyone together on a stage and present because we're in this world of competition you know, in other words, everyone cry -on. meaning yeah. all the people yeah. who yeah. channel I mean, cry on at yeah. the same time and Lee had yeah. them on stage in Germany uh, because again we're in this paradigm where we feel like we have this competition yeah. and then people were asking lee well who's the real crayon <laughs> like this person's channeling crayon and, you know, and every, now this one you know where that's born from is that yeah we have a beautiful beautiful creative source mm. which you call god and everybody competes for it mm. i mean how many people have faced off with you in your life and said this is the only truth god is there but my god is the one you want to go to don't go to his god mm -hmm. and, and 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 so I was so tired of that paradigm because people would see me channel say, well, there's some guy over there channeling Cryon. Are you going to like uh, sue him? <laughs> and I go, well, you don't understand. <laughs> uh, you don't understand. That's an additive. That's a benefit. Mm -hmm. We have wonderful information now coming from two people, three people, yes. four people. And I put them all on stage because they're worldwide from many countries. And we did it twice in Europe. And so what happened is everybody channeled the same kind of information loving uh, empowering it was a beautiful time and a lot of people slapping their heads going in aha and you know this is not a competitive thing this is a new paradigm well bless you for doing that uh, that must have been amazing to be in the audience or yeah, just like yeah. having all those pixels come at you at once that's a lot of well you know it was the most amazing when I told my host I wanted to do it even he had trouble with it hmm like, in other words, he had to get his head around it, too. It's like, why would you do that? <laughs> and I say, to show people the grandness uh, and, and another paradigm they didn't expect of something that is happening here. Yeah. And that is, you know, there's no competition with God. Beautiful. Did you have to vet anybody first? Like, just find out, like, really, is that cry on before oh, they come I, on? Listen, I threw a fleece down when I first started. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more. When you, when you ask the question that you're going to ask, and I know you do, and they always say, is, how did it start? And um, I didn't believe it at all. And then even after it was proven, I didn't believe it to a certain extent and had to wait. Ten, it was three years into it before I really started moving on it. So I was tough Good. To, to, I would say, believe anything so bizarrely different than my reality as a linear engineer. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm. It would be also interesting to know if there's complete, well, we are all one on some level. Yes. And the question is very 3D linear, which is it would be interesting to know if there's complete independence between all of you beings channeling cryon or if there's actually a connection there. There's a connection with all of us. There's mm. a connection with me and you. Our souls mm. overlap. Mm. This is something else that people don't understand. Because, again, we are linear, and, and Monica mentioned it first, and she said we have one skin, one face, one name, and we proceed through life as independent people, uh, you, you know, interfacing together. When, what if I told you that we are all of our souls overlap? You know what the best example of that is, is identical twins. Mm -hmm. Now, they have identical DNA, which helps this to be visible and happen. And on the other side of the earth, one will be and another one will be on, the, on opposite sides. They'll know if their mother dies together and call each other instantly. Something is connecting those two that is beyond anything we believe. Welcome to this whole idea. With overlapping souls, we're all connected as, as a human race in integrity and in love. And you know where we saw that just recently, a no. few months ago? is when we saw the war begin mm. and the earth took a vote. Mm. You saw it, even Switzerland, no more war. We don't want this. This is not where we're heading. We're not gonna endorse it, you know. And the whole, the whole planet voted almost within a day or so. They don't want this. That's a first, if you think about it. Almost everybody polarizes in the past world wars and there's East and there's West and there's this and that and everybody lines up to have another war and we didn't. That, should show, that shows you something. We have an overlapping consciousness that's starting to happen on this planet that says we're together in more ways than you think. Maybe not politically. It doesn't matter. It has to do with love. It has to do with compassion and what we really want out of life. 
Yeah, it's a great example. Truly it is. And hopefully we're seeing the tides turn right now. We are seeing this. No, hopefully at all. We are seeing. I believe that we are empowered to make this change. Mm. We're not out of the woods. And Crian said, you know, when the light turns on, ugly stuff is going to show. He also said something, another prediction. He said, when the light starts to show, and it did, there will be those who are invested in the dark and the old ways which will emerge and try to pull it backwards. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, welcome to those who are still at World War II. They're, I mean, that they're invested in wanting to return to a Cold War, to threats, to all. And, and there was, right there, a prediction, again, coming true. It's, it's going to be tough to get through a situation where people are still invested in the old ways. Uh, especially, there's some other things coming as well that will uh, exemplify that. Interesting. Very interesting you would say that. Yes, I agree. Uh, when the light was turned on the underbelly, uh, and whatever is in the underbelly has been crawling out yep. in spades. Very interesting. I have a friend who recently was just so, so upset politically about an overturning of something that occurred. Um, and my solace to her, you know, get politically involved, absolutely take action and know that as a metaphysician, this is good. This is a blessing. It means now we can change. Now we can look at something and make different choices permanently. Mm -hmm. So yes, I am, I'm with you and cry on absolutely on that. And, uh, and interesting about what's to come. <laughs> so to jump into the past or since there is none, <laughs> let's talk about Lemuria. Monica, one of your most recent books relates to all things Lemurian, and it's titled The Women of Lemuria. I'm quite sure I was Mu. I was a Lemurian myself, the continent of Mu. And what is the Lemurian sisterhood? Beautiful question. I'm glad you asked that. And what's interesting, when I started to write this book, The Women of Lemuria, first of all, I was so enamored with that word, Lemuria. Never heard it before until Cryon came into my life. And what was interesting is that I had always heard the term Atlantis and people talk about Atlantis and the past lives in Atlantis. It's very known in the metaphysical world. But Atlantis is also known in mainstream media. There have been TV shows and there's <laughs> been all sorts of movies and so much is known about the myths and legends of Atlantis. And I was thinking, well, why do we know about Atlantis but not Lemuria? What is the reason of that? And so I want to just share this fascinating insight into how myths and legends can be based on some elements of truth. And I think I, our culture is one where we enjoy myths. We love legends. Look at the popularity of Star Wars and how that has just embraced us on this hero's journey, the hero's adventure. And so the myths of Atlantis, first of all, let's look at what it is. It's often this civilization with this amazing power and technology that abused it and as a result it got destroyed and it sank and went underwater so here we have cryon that gives us information on lemuria and coincidentally there are many versions of what Lemuria is and what it represents so it's easy to go and do research and find out lots of information that sometimes appear to contradict each other. And I always say to people, take a look at everything and just use your discernment as to what it could represent. Because often information is given to us in metaphors. And so if you start looking at the metaphor behind something instead of the literal value of what is given, you will start finding those cookie crumbs and connecting the dots to the story behind it. So Cryon comes along and gives us information that Lemuria was a place that actually existed physically on the planet and that today that place is known as the chain of islands that make up Hawaii. 
Now, often in the reports of Lemuria, you have this missing continent of Mu, the land of Mu, and how this continent was somewhere in the Atlantic or it was somewhere in the Pacific Ocean or Indian Ocean. And then all of these things happened. And geologically, when you look at these claims, none of them make sense. And yet Cryon gave us some information that paints a very different story. And the story is this, is that there was a bubble of magma that was pushed up under the crust of the earth. And all of those chain of islands that is Hawaii, if you imagine that all being pushed up from a bubble of magma underneath to create one mountain peak or one land mass, this is what Cryon calls was Lemuria, the land of Mu. And there's actually geological precedent for this. If you look at Yellowstone National Park, where they have now had geologists say that there are etchings that represent glaciers that were on top of that mountain. And what could have done that? Well, it was a bubble of magma that pushed up that area that created mountains so high you had ice and glaciers form on them. So there's precedent of what Cryon is describing happened in Lemuria. And the time frame of this is about 50,000 years ago is where we had those beginnings of Lemurian civilization. So when I start questioning of 50,000 years ago, the only culture living today that's had that kind of history is the Australian Aboriginals in Australia. They have been living on the continent of Australia, isolated in the moment for 50,000 years. So yes, there's not just precedent for the geological information that Cryon's given. There is a culture that has been around for all of that time frame. And interestingly, the creation story of Aboriginals in Australia is that we came from the Seven Sisters. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you start looking at the creation story of Indigenous all over the planet that didn't right. even know each other, they tell you the same thing. We came from the Seven Sisters, a cluster of stars known as the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. So now here we have the story of Lemuria, the land that was there, and that those that came to Lemuria were the Pleiadians, the mm -hmm. female star mothers that came to create divinity within the human beings that were born on the earth. So this is the Adam and Eve story. This is our creation that we had intervention from another planet of ascended beings that came to give us that spark, that divinity inside of us. And so the whole point of Lemuria was to have those go through this experience where they learnt core spiritual truth from those who had had it taught to them and learnt about the God inside and how consciousness controls physics and how you are an extension of that creator. And so Lemuria's purpose, the women of Lemuria, is all about what has been given to us, imprinted within our DNA of core spiritual truth. And at a certain point in time, Cryon says the bubble of magma began to subside. And as it came down, they did not know if the whole island would sink. Mm -hmm. And really, this was the signal that the teaching direct from the Star Mothers is now at an end and humanity is on a journey. The hero's journey begins where we <laughs> are to find out what do we choose to do with our consciousness when our teachers are no longer physically there in front of us. We now have to go through our journey and decide what are we going to do with our consciousness? Where do we take it? Now that we've had the seeds planted, what will happen? And so that remembrance spills out as that Atlantic remembrance. And what was this high technology that we had? It wasn't technology, it was high consciousness. Mm. And high consciousness can control physics. Some could look at that as high technology. And so what has happened since then? Well, 
we're looking at the tail end of it. <laughs> Everything possible has happened in that period of time. And if you want to know where the consciousness of a society is, take a look at how it treats women and children and animals. Mm. And that's kind of the litmus test. And I really feel, as you mentioned before, the light is turned on, things that are ugly are being revealed, and it's time for us to clean it up. And that's where integrity is now coming to the fore. And that's why we're seeing things like the Me Too movement, where it's, it's no longer acceptable to do those things. That's why we see Black Lives Matter, because it's no longer acceptable to do those kinds of things to each other. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Thank Beautiful. you for asking. Yes, clean up on Isle Earth. <laughs> <laughs> this is huge. Thank you for that explanation. And you know, I understand that if that voicing the Lemurian language, should we be able to do it, would be best if we spoke Lemurian. But in lieu of that, the next best thing is to speak Hebrew or an ancient language, maybe Sumerian, uh, coupled with our intent to activate the consciousness of DNA within us. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that, the languaging, and then most important, what is the consciousness of DNA? Well, I'll briefly answer about the language and throw over to Lee about the DNA. But to me, I think, you know, what is the language of Lemuria? I think it's the language of love. Mm -hmm. And every language, no matter what it is on the planet, when you see two humans interacting with each other, even if you don't understand what they're saying, and if they're talking to each other in a very loving way, that's a language you can feel. Look at our music. When we hear music, even if it's another language we don't understand, we connect. And so Lemurian language, it's the language of light, love, and music. Yeah. So now let's ask Lee about the DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Karan says in our DNA, everything we've ever been, ever done is there. Now, this is very, very esoteric information. Here's where it gets spooky, folks. And if you are one who doesn't believe in past lives, uh, go get a drink of water and then come back later when we're done. So, because I don't want to offend anybody, but this is the premise. I, I'd like to remind and anybody who's looking at it, uh, it took me a long time as a good Christian boy to go there and to understand that. One of the first, I would say, organized uh, spiritual systems on this planet, if not the first, was Hinduism. And intuitively, they went right to past lives. Uh, right to the idea of there's um, karma. In other words, there's remembrances that you bring forward. That was the first intuitive thought. Um, later, it got it got changed a lot, and we end up with um, no, you only live one life. And and then I'm now I'm realizing it. That particular structure allows for reward and punishment. And in the, <laughs> in the past life area, it doesn't. So how much of that is um, would you say created? Uh, for a, a reality of a men system and how much of, of it is uh, is not. Past lives, according to Kron, is always there. Your everything you've ever learned, including those languages, Sumerian, Hebrew, Lumerian, or whatever, if you were there, if you have a lineage of an old soul, which is somebody who's been on this earth a very, very long time, that's still in your DNA in a way, um, I would say, conceptually. You don't need to go back and learn those languages. You spoke them. Many of us did. What we're now doing is learning another language, and that language is the language of compassion. Mm -hmm. And that is a language. Uh, how, how do you react um, when somebody says to you, for instance, here's an, an old energy. How do you react when somebody says, I don't like you, I've never liked you, you know you're awful, and pushes you with her finger. And what does that do? It elicits immediate old energy reaction. Well, I don't like you either. Or, you know, or let's step outside if you're a guy, whatever. You know what happens to me now? Because crying has sat on me for so long. I look at the person and I feel, I feel bad that they're having a bad day. Mm. It doesn't even relate to me. <laughs> and I realize that is a choice. And that is a new kind of thinking. I'm pulling upon a sacred DNA, a DNA that has gotten bigger with those things because I have a soul. 
That's a language. And we're starting to be given and fed a lot more of that beautiful soul energy into our linear DNA, if you want to call it that. DNA, think of it as a storage place of not just the human genome, but of information, everything we've been, everything we've ever had happen to us, and the future, and also the sacredness, perhaps, of who we are. Ah, my life has changed so much. My reactions to things have changed. How I, uh, basically, the reactions. Um, I have I have learned uh, to not react, if you want to call it that, and in, 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 instead there's an examination of the issue. When anything happens, when buttons are seemingly pressed, I don't I don't react anymore. Uh, this is what, this is one of the teachings of Kryon. You take a look at what's actually happening. If somebody's pushing your buttons, it's their issue, not yours. You didn't ask for them to be pressed. <laughs> so why should you react at all? These are the kinds of things that promote um, not only just the sanity, but maturity and compassionate action, kindness. Can you feel kindness to somebody who's, who's yelling at you? That's yes. a good question, huh? I know I can, because yes. I always imagine that I'm Teflon. When honestly, yeah. when it's happening yeah. and that uh, it just flows over me and whatever mm -hmm. this is for them, God bless them. You know, it's just it doesn't happen often. But when it does, yes, I am. I'm a duck. I don't absorb any of it. And then, Debbie, the next thing to do is is um, rather than react, can you feel kindness toward them? And, and, and that's a learned thing. And I've had to learn it. It took me yeah. a long time. And, and I can now uh, there. Anybody who will do that, I know is having an issue. Mm -hmm. It's probably not what they wanted to do that day. And that's a lot more, it's deeper in them than mm -hmm. you know. And so this is, this is our work, and that is to help people understand, realize what's happening, and realize they can turn that around as well. So it's not just, you know, what if you're one of those bullies, and you always have been. There's reasons for that. It would be nice to know what they are so you can relax in your life and have more kindness. All of these things are doable. We're, we're changing. Human nature if you want to define human nature, it would be the way humans react, the way humans are. And that has been the way of it forever. A human nature, according to a psychologist, is static. It never changes. This is a change. And psychologists may disagree until 20 or 30 years have gone by. But <clears throat> we believe, something Crane also said, there'll come a time when sociologists, psychologists will look at this time maybe in 50 years, maybe in 100, and say this was the beginning of the end of a barbarous era. Oh, wow. Hmm. And so we are starting to see the change hmm. in human nature. Yeah, I want to be alive to see the fulfillment. Oh, I will you be. be. <laughs> yeah, you will be. You may look a little different, but you will be alive. Okay, yeah. good. And I also want to be alive for when the contact work happens. I'm, yeah. I mean, I've, I've already done contact work, but I mean the real deal when they, yeah. <laughs> when the ships really come. Definitely. So. Uh, and there it's, I don't think it's that far away. If you ask the majority of people, do you believe in extraterrestrial life? They'll go, well, of course. <laughs> do you? So it's, it's gone from, are you, boy, are you nuts to the, um, what the astronomers are telling us. It would be amazing if there wasn't. And the more galaxies they discover and the more stuff they real to physics is the same. The chemistry is the same. So what if it happened everywhere? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I was yeah. one of those people. I was one of the deeply metaphysical, into channeling, into everything cutting edge. But when it came to UFOs, yeah. you know, I couldn't. I just really, I had no capacity for that reality. And then one day I watched an interview on TV and my whole world changed. I mean, literally, I felt like I drank a potion and I woke up with new eyes uh -huh. and said, of course, this is the truth. And now I'm deeply involved in yep. that world. Um, I've seen spacecraft since then. I've definitely had contact. And I looked back on my life and I could see all the places I shut off where th there were reference points from when I was very young yeah. when things happened and I couldn't process them. So I, I gave them a name, you know, they didn't exist. They were fake. I, they were, I put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, I feel whole with all of it. Um, and very excited about it. I also had to get over the, 
the idea of the fear of, oh, you know, the movies we see, it's going to be awful. And now I'm like, no, they're benevolent. And most, not all of them, but many of them are so far advanced and waiting for us, wanting for us, desiring for us to be a healthy, peaceful planet and humanity. You, you, so. truly, you truly are a leader in this and, and a future thinker. This is what we teach. The mm -hmm. movies are a reflection, I'll say it again, because you said it, of our fear. Uh, it's the same fear that we had of other cultures, you know, hundreds of years ago when we circle our wagons because we didn't know who was coming. And that's it's, we're afraid of them because we don't understand them. You know, what if that were the case? What if we were the new kids on the block and yeah. most of civilizations on other planets have been doing what we've done? You know, if you talk to biologists, they say that Earth got a very slow start of life. It happened several times. And it, it took like you know, an extra few million years even to get it going in photosynthesis. It's interesting. What if some of them in the same creation story we have, four billion years old or so, had it millions of years before us? We would be looking at advanced um, civilization, not advanced necessarily only technically, but conscious advancement, like what we're going through now. And I agree. Isn't it interesting that all the movies are, uh, they, they've come to conquer us, uh, steal our water, eat us, okay. and there's only a few who actually broach the issue that they may be friendly. I like that. Yes, and the funny thing is with us versus them, we are them. We are them. Right? <laughs> if you really took a genetic test, yeah. you would find out I'm part Lyrian, I'm part Pleiadian, uh, Andromeda, yeah. Antares, etc. Yeah. We are that. We were populated here by that. And uh, it's all concurrent anyway. So yeah. it, indeed, thank you for that. And, and, and thank you. I love to hear that um, from someone I'm respecting as much as I do you. Uh, and and because it has it, it it's going to be uh, truth. It's going to be reality sooner than later. We'll all look back and go, why did we go through this? You know, <laughs> oh. why did we wait so long? Yeah. Well, I want to I want to nerd out a little bit. I have oh, to good. take so um, and I just I'm not going to give everything away. But honestly, so <laughs> this was mind blowing and I highly recommend, I'm, I'm pulling these up because I want people to be able to go get those books. I've already verbally been gushing and people I know have been going out to get your books. Um, and just a little history. So my sister-in-law, Tamara, uh, had a past life regression the last couple of months and came back and was telling me, oh my God, I was Lemurian and I was on the sea. I was seafaring and I did this and that. And I mean, it was so detailed. And then I opened, now she knows nothing. I opened this book and I'm reading, I'm like, oh, so I reached out to her right away. Oh my God, you were right. And so for folks who are listening, I just want to give you a few tips. And again, I'm only like the brilliance of that much of the book. You still have this much to go. And these are just things that I highlighted. Like, so this is from the Gaia effect. I want you to hear some of these Lemurian tidbits. Lemuria representative represented the relationship between Gaia and humanity. They established the crystalline grid. They imprinted their energy in the cave of creation, which contains 350 million crystals, one for each soul. Lemurians carried the oldest Akash for an old soul. Lemuria was located, much like Monica was saying, where the Pleiadians originally landed on Earth. It was a mountain island known today as the Big Island of Hawaii. They had pure quantum DNA, and quantum DNA means one with the universe. 90% of their DNA was used then, compared to the 30% that is being used today, populated with what the Pleiadians passed on to them. Lemurians were the original human family on Earth. They were seafaring people. And this is where the multidimensional indigo children began. When the oceans rose, the mountains sank and magma began to flow. Many left, not all as you know, some of you died in that, and some of you left. And many left, it was the end of Lemuria. Those who left often reestablished themselves on Easter Island and New Zealand. And ta-da, 
many Lemurians are alive and back today. Hi, Lemurians. Mm -hmm. So yeah, highly recommended. There's so much more, but I wanted to nerd out on that because the information in these books just keeps on giving. It's really good. You know, good Debbie, stuff. I can't, I just, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to interrupt you. I just did. <laughs> you just interrupted. You said the word. We have been to Easter Island, not once. <laughs> and we go there in Australia, in the middle of Australia, Ayers Rock, which is called Uluru. We talk to the indigenous, we talk to the shaman and shaw women. Mm -hmm. And it's so absolutely fascinating to hear them give this exact story, what you just said. We came from the stars. We came from uh, the Pleiadian. And to hear them talk about it is like, we just want to sit down and listen because it's everything we've been teaching and writing about from others who, who it's their history. Uh, it's just astonishing. Yes. I know I work with a Peruvian shaman, a woman right now, shaw woman. I've never heard that. Yep. And she always starts out incantations with bringing in the star people. And it's beautiful. They all knew what it took us so long to understand. You guys, what are you, <clears throat> what's your feeling or understanding of light language? I can tell you what it's been uh, seen as. It's fairly new. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not new for those who are esoterically minded and they're, you know, they're born knowing it kind of a thing. But for in metaphysics, it's fairly new because it's now being actually exposed and taught. Um, it, it would be, uh, let's, let's call it an esoteric language of, um, of compassion and love. It's a, a language that reflects, I would say, our inner soul. And it's not an actual language because it's represented in dance, in song, in verbalization. It's not a language you go and learn. It's something to be studied. Um, it's, it's actually part of uh, Lemurian culture. Um, the the uh, codes on the wheel that Kran talks about are reflected in light language. So I think it's something fairly new that we're seeing that is not fully understood yet. And many are, are experiencing it and starting to compartmentalize it, unfortunately. So they'll say, well, it's this. And someone else will say, no, well, it's this. It's actually all of them. So it really is a new language of love, I think. Incredible. You know, I, I sing and I'm in a band called Lions of Lyra and we mm. do very uplifting music, meaningful music and sound healing and meditation. And we recently came back from five days in Arizona where we presented all of that at a contact a retreat. And while we were there, there were people there who do light language. And I became just fascinated by the possibility what if while I sang and Rob played guitar, if you did your light language and we just improvise and let's see in this space, because I understand going into a matrix with somebody like that, what gets created? And it was pure magic. Nobody knew what was going to happen, what it was going to sound like, what would be created. The people who attended were just blown away. We were blown away by this sacred space we all went into. Together. Debbie, that, that's the way it's designed. Ah. You, you were very intuitive to ask for that. Mm. It's, it isn't just, again, we're so linear. We're going to go watch a dancer. We're going to go watch a, a, a guitarist or whatever. It's supposed to be all of those things together. Ah, and so it is. We want to do more. We're yeah. highly open to yeah. evolving this further. Also, at this particular retreat, while we were doing the meditation, a gentleman who's been to your events, Al, uh, brought along your now tone therapy system meditation device. Ah. Oh my God, how cool is that? These little round balls. I don't know. I'm not saying that right. Discs, maybe. Yeah. But they make the most gorgeous meditative sounds. Can you talk about these small gadgets and their healing tones? I'd be happy to. We discovered them. They're not ours. They're from the um, here now, I think. Um, oh, I can get them. Go ahead. Why don't you go <laughs> take take? Monica's got. Well, you can. It's you correct. Wanna, I have it here. Yeah. It's so, N O W Tone Therapy. Yeah, and we got introduced to them from a medium by the name of Suzanne Giesman. She was at our event, and she managed to bring out these 
little speakers that have a three minute meditation track. And so she brought them into our awareness. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, this is like the perfect question I know. for Lee, because yeah. as you know, you read he was an audio engineer. And what Lee's not sharing with you is that he was very musically gifted. There were so many instruments that he was able to play. His father and his grandfather, there's a lineage of musicians in Lee's biological family tree. And so he had this skill of being an audio engineer in the recording booth. He could read music, he could hear pitch, he could hear everything and read everything. And that's why people wanted him mixing the music because his ear is there. So now we have someone who understands music who then channels information from Cryon about not just music, but the overtones and the harmonics that are communicating to our DNA because our DNA is both a transmitter and a receiver. So there is encoded messaging within those overtones and frequencies. So now uh, that we've got the little speakers on the table, I want Carl to kind of switch back over to Lee. And As if by magic yeah. they have well, appeared. Magic, well, look at that. <laughs> Magically no, they have this appeared. This sounds like a commercial. I just wanted to tell you, it, this is, um, we didn't make these, but we've been enamored with them, and the sound is really, really good. And they're, only, they're about three minutes, and you, you start them together. We're not going to do it here because Zoom doesn't work just, well with tones at all. Don't do it. No, I was but just But this is what show. they look like. Yeah. And um, you can get them in several places. Uh, we sell them on our site, but that you can get them on uh, lots of different places. But that, that's, so what, that's what they are. We love them. Yeah. Oh, we've lost sound. Do you want to join our band? If you're so <laughs> musically inclined, I, I'm giving you an open invitation to create magic. Okay, what, in, what instrument can I play? <clears throat> well, most are not covered. I do percussion. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, Rob does guitar. I sing. I'd be happy to do the triangle. That's percussion. <laughs> She's already nope. doing percussion. Nope. Bring it, bring it. I only have so many hands. Okay, uh, look, I know you. I know you need a banjo player. <gasps> Do you really play banjo? No, I lied. I lied about that because <laughs> it was a joke. So let's forget this. <laughs> well, it's an open invitation. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> so I want to. I promised Al, who because of these magical instruments that he brought, I wanted. He has a question for you. And it's about Big Pharma. And he said, here's his quote, I know the sentiment has been, oh, this, excuse me, I know the sediment has been stirred up the last years. This is Al Vitovic. <clears throat> the sediment has been stirred up the last years, revealing the shadows of iniquity. How much time do you think before Big Pharma collapses or can it transform into an organization that actually helps humanity? I, I think the answer to that is uh, twofold. First of all, uh, we, we are now saying inappropriate big pharma mm -hmm. because uh, there's chemistry out there and including that I mean, mixed with supplements and, and undiscovered things from nature that will be called big pharma. So it's inappropriate big pharma that we know all about. It's the folks that are advertising after 10 o'clock at night on television, if you've got cable, that tell you you're a victim of absolutely everything and have to take something and they'll hold it up. And... Uh, uh, I mean, it's just a billion, billions of dollars. It's taken it out of the hands of doctors and put it in the hands of, of people who are now hearing what's wrong with them on television. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing that is so unfortunate is the ones where you'll have the pharmaceutical industry um, peddling um, drugs they know better. First of all, they know better because uh, there's new things that are better that they're holding in the drawer until they get their amortization schedules finished, uh, and then they'll bring them out. This has now become a corporate or business keeping people sick for money. There are probably cures for a lot of things out there that are not being given to us. When we discover this, we're about to, and this is what Krein has said, um, the public will not accept it, period. It's, it's, it's going to be... Um, <laughs> epic. I think uh, it may take a movie. Somebody with um, mm -hmm. connections and probably overseas will do it. 
So because the lobby is enormous and it'd be dangerous to produce a movie like that uh, here, we'll show and tell. And there will be those who know it and have been part of Big Pharma who will be part of the movies. And it's going to be a documentary. It may be an adventure story that sounds crazy that then they find out is real. It's eminent. And if, if I had an audience right now that I could see how all of you and I would ask you, raise your, raise your hand if you think that uh, Big Farm is in our, in our corner. I'm not seeing many hands there. So almost everyone knows this. Something's wrong. Even in what we experience, and I don't want to get political here, but even when we experienced with COVID, there was some of that going on. So there was a lot of money being generated inappropriately. And it's not about who got the shot or not. It's just how that was managed and, and who got the money from where. And this is what we're talking about. You know, in a time where we all needed help, this was not a time to jump on the money wagon. And there's many who did. Um, and so that will come out as well. So it's, it's, it's imminent. And this is what Al, I'm sure, has heard from Cryon before. How long? We are in charge of that. And it, the money is amazingly there to, to keep it from happening. But there'll be a tipping point. How much money, um, let's go back in time. How much money do you think was invested in tobacco in the 50s? I in can't even imagine because money oh. was so different. I mean, oh. it would have been billions now. Everybody smoked, first of all. Well, everybody. Mm. But I mean, I remember going to college. Uh, no, I, I went to high school with a kid who drove me because I didn't have my license yet. And he smoked. And and then, of course, he put it away. And anybody who was anybody, all of the kids smoked because it was cool. So here we came with one thing, one thing that happened. We got a message. I don't know how we got it, that the tobacco companies knew that it created cancer. They knew it. And what they did instead, not to tell us, was to create a cartoon character so they could get the kids addicted first. Oh. Wow, when we found that out, it was their downfall. Cigarettes are produced in America right now, and they all go to Europe. Not here. And if you've been to Europe, you can see it. They haven't caught on yet to it. Did you know there's warning, yeah, warnings on all of the packages? It'll, it'll, it'll end your life. Yes. <laughs> they still buy them. Yeah, so, and the price point right now, I, I don't even understand how people do that or why no. they do that. But, you know, exactly. And I will say, you know, with my insurance and I supposedly have good insurance, the only thing that's ever covered ever is pharmaceuticals, a hundred percent, almost doesn't matter what it is. And then as far as COVID, indeed, you know, when ivermectin came out and they were starting to say, this is a cure, this will get you well quickly, it became illegal, but it's not FDA approved, but it's for horses. I have a dear friend who lives in Amsterdam. She couldn't even get her hands on it because it's illegal in Amsterdam and doctors were having their licenses removed for even giving out ivermectin to somebody who had COVID. It's insane. So we, in the past we had choices. We had choices. We could, we have the, um, uh, depending upon, you know, who is who you, you can uh, take the jab as we say, and there's and all that. But what if you also decided to take this and that with it, what well, became illegal? No, you can't take that with it. Don't you dare go there. And by the way, these supplements, ah, eh, they're no good either. So it was directing us right to pharmaceuticals. That's where the money was. I think that's unconscionable. We should have had a choice to do, to do many things, including, you know, uh, taking the jab. So it's, it's just, it should have been the choice that we had. And we, we actually, it was directed right to one source and basically one or two companies who made billions and billions of dollars off us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> so the new cry on Circle of 12 is a major departure from anything we've experienced with the cry on channeling thus far in the last 31 years. Mm -hmm. What can we expect going forward? What does that look like? When, uh, when COVID happened, I thought I was out of a job. Mm. I can remember coming home from Iceland. COVID developed while we were in Iceland doing a tour with 70 or 80 people, I think. Monica was with me. I got to come home. Monica didn't because you could not come to the United States um, from anywhere unless you were a citizen at that point in time for fear that it would spread the virus. Or a resident. And I was neither at and that And she was point. neither at that time and she yeah. is now. So what we had was three months she had to stay in another country. 
She had to wind her way home through allowed countries, including Denmark and Dubai, and finally come back to me. But um, I, I'm sure everyone has their wild COVID stories. I'm sure stories. they do. But yeah. we, we earn our living traveling. We would go to various countries and we would give seminars uh, all over the world and all over the states and all. And when that hit, we couldn't even travel in the states because there was nobody who could assemble anymore. You know what I'm talking about. You couldn't have meetings. <clears throat> we thought it might happen and we'd be okay in two or three months. We didn't expect like two years. So I thought I was out of a job and suddenly things came together in a way that was miraculous. Uh, when that happened, by the way, I will tell you something I had learned from Cryon, don't react. So I had a moment of, ah! <laughs> And then I realized there was another thing happening, a shift of paradigm of what I would do. I had been in as an audio engineer and broadcast most of my life in one way. And we had met so many of these great people who were doing some streaming. I called the friend, Carl, who is behind the cameras right now, mm -hmm. uh, and Greg, who did all the audio, and called them and said, let's change the paradigm. How would you like to build a studio and do something different? And within weeks, we had our studio. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we, we tried some things that worked and some things that didn't. And finally, Cryon said, stop all that. You've got something new to do. And Cryon gave the paradigm how to do it and even how much to charge. <laughs> it became Healing Wednesdays, where we would interview healing guests and people who are making changes around this planet every single week, 52 weeks a year. Yeah. And you know what's so beautiful about that story? I mean, you've got your own reality going on that you are responding to and coming up with a solution to. Mm -hmm. But then there's a whole world out there feeling cut off, wanting guidance, wanting connection, wanting direction. And when you're up in weeks with your studio built, doing Healing Wednesdays, being able to connect with folks, now they've got that connection they need so much, even in their home. So how beautiful. Debbie, you will be the first one to acknowledge and know exactly what I'm talking about. We reach more people in one week mm. on the air with one program yep. than we did all year long in the old paradigm. This is the way it should be. And this is exactly what I teach when I teach spiritual <clears throat> messengers about being interviewed. Why would you be interviewed? Tell me how many people you can reach on stage and they're not you or cry on or Monica. Yeah. So like if they reach a hundred people in an audience, that's great. Now let's talk about a show that's got a half a million, couple of million, whatever the reach is, yeah. it will change your life with visibility. It's so important right now. It also changed my, my thinking. Mm. I always was in kind of a closet, um, metaphysical, spiritual closet. I'm a channeler who wants to meet a channeler. And most, most people would say, I don't believe in that crap. You know, don't go there. I'm not interested. And suddenly, that's not the case either. I'm on mm -hmm. your show. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm on many shows now. Yeah. Um, I've, I've even got one coming up that's um, that corporate investors want to know what's happening on the earth. <laughs> and it's oh, cha-cha-cha-cha. Like, that's and awesome. And are willing to actually give a listen. I mean, why not? And in the past, that was not um, acceptable. It's just too woo-woo, too weird. That a, a is beautiful. Well, yeah. right, exactly. The world has changed so much. I love the fact that you are bridging over into mainstream. Mm -hmm. May you, you know, bridge that for many to come because as it should be, really. So Cryon recently said that our bodies are designed to live hundreds of years and we need to slow down and create longer telomeres what is the teaching around this god knows i'd like to live longer because <laughs> i grew up with probably much the same as you you get to a certain age you retire things start to fall apart you creak you moan the bo bones the joints uh, whatever you know that befalls people you can't move as well travel as well i don't know uh, but i would like very much to utilize this body this being and this possibility for a long lifespan in india there are masters who lived um what, what was um monica the uh dr naram's uh, teacher yeah we've 
recently been introduced to a wonderful book, Ancient Secrets of a Master Healer. And within that, we're introduced to healers who live to 145 years of age. And Kryon has said that our bodies are designed to live 900 years and that the terms that you heard in the Bible of beings living for 600 years it's not a misprint and so you have to ask why is it that we are not living even to a hundred years and the answer from crying partly is linked to consciousness the other part is that it's a program that we have and so how do we get out of that program and into the new program of longevity and may I ask you, is that program collective consciousness or something else? Part of it is collective consciousness and it's expectations of how long do you feel you are going to believe that you can live. And so collectively we are told one thing. And so it is up to the individual to say, that's not my reality. So you're actually like a fish swimming upstream against the current. Only those that have that real conviction that you can do it, they can make it, but it's a lot more difficult because they're swimming against the current. Does that help explain I'm, how? I'm just, um, we can go, yeah. we, can, we can keep going and saying, since we know consciousness is energy and it's been proved in these last years that it is actually energy, think for a moment, do you or do you not have control of your cellular structure? Now, yes. most people will say, well, most would say, no, we were told they're autonomic uh, and we only have to do this and that. The whole idea of think yourself well is, a, is, a, is a not really true. And yes, it is. <laughs> and and uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton has proved it in the, the father of, of, of um, epi e epigenetics. Epi I have the trouble with that word. The, the thing is this. What if every morning if you awaken, you expected to live a lot longer than any of your uh, of peers or parents lived. Not only that, you started counting what you were grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, you started looking at all the things that make sense on the planet, how you were going to work that day. In other words, you are starting to fill your cellular structure and it chases away worry, anxiety, fear, all the things that make you older and stop longevity. And that is what has been proven. People who worry about things die early. I think people who are always in fear, they die early. Now, the big one. I had a friend who became my insurance man, my life insurance man. I went to high school with him. And we were really good friends. Um, but he was a, a hypochondriac, if you want to say that. He was afraid of, of everything. And over his lifetime, he caught everything he was afraid of and died about six years ago. Hmm. He's my peer. He died six years. I mean, and I wanted to say to him, Herb, you created absolutely everything. And that, that weakened your body. Every single, every single thing you caught weakened your body. Now, that tells you something. Consciousness changed his lifespan. Let's reverse it. Let's now start working with the opposite. I am not going to get that virus because it can't get me. <laughs> you know, and people will say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not sure that can happen. I can tell you it does happen. It can happen. Crying has even said when your cells are vibrating at a higher level, disease cannot attach it to it. Did you hear that? Yes. Now, I want to see that starting to be proven and happening. Studies of who's living longer and why. And you're going to start seeing that the people who are not worrying and not in anxious and not in fear are starting to live longer lives and start this is this is fairly new to us all and there's still people shaking their heads and saying eh i believe it when i see it well get ready to see it yeah because there's something on the earth called blue zones and these are you know about this i'm sure these are areas on the earth where people are living longer than any other place on the planet. And there are scientists who have gone there to find out why. So for instance, in Sardinia, I love Italy so much. And Sardinia <laughs> has this amazing population of people who live very long and they drink, they drink alcohol, they smoke, but 
Family is everything to them. They eat the most beautiful, you know, food because of where they are and where how it's grown. They always take naps and they rest. Obviously, um, spirituality is important to them, but their family, their connection, the love. And so they vibrate, their cells vibrate very high. And there's other areas that people want to look into it and find out more about that. So this exists already. I don't know about the 900 years. Boy, does that sound amazing. Yeah. And I know that there are extraterrestrial cultures that live that long and beyond. Well, if, if uh, consciousness is part of evolution, not just, you know, what we think about evolution and what we study, what if we are designed to evolve to higher levels of consciousness? And then you're going to start using more of your DNA, as you pointed out. And the, this is what we're taught that, for instance, those who seated us, the Pleiadians, happened. They had an evolution of a, a million years or more beyond us, and they actually became pieces of light. Um, mm -hmm. They became part of their soul. Uh, all of the, is, that, is that even possible, or would that violate everything you were told in church? And that's a decision you're going to have to make. Here's a big one. Is God bigger than anything you are ever told? That's what I discovered. And that allows for things you were never even told, impossible mm. things that we were never even told. And this is one of them. And we're talking about them now freely, the future. I love that. Oh, my gosh. That makes so much sense to recognize God is bigger than anything I was ever told. Therefore, you as a creator can conceive and achieve bigger than you ever imagined and live a life grander than you ever supposed, et cetera, et cetera. That's like a ripple. That's awesome. Oof. Um, I have two final questions. So just following on what you just said, something, so I did it this morning. I've got a beautiful giant Tibetan gong here. The sound is beyond. I got it because of the sound. So this morning I woke up, I went in the living room, boom, <laughs> I hit that gong. And then I just, to, to all corners, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I gave thanks, you know, to the Pachamama, to the air, to the sky, to nature, to the animals, to all the things in my life of which I'm so grateful. And when I was done, I took out my Koshi chimes, which are um, angelical, and rang those and went on with my day. Also set an intention. Do you both have a ritual or practice that keeps you grounded or centered? And if you don't mind to each tell me what that would be. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I think I don't have necessarily a specific ritual how you described. Instead, I have, I feel access to tools given through Cryon's wisdom imparted to us that I draw upon in the moments that I need them. And honestly, Lee is part of that drawing on tools for me. So when I'm not able to create it for myself, when I voice it to Lee, he will remind me and put me back into that area. And so mm -hmm. I'll just give you an example. When I have someone who is going through a challenging situation and my heart is so oh caught up in their challenge, one of the things that has helped me to go through it, there's this Hawaiian prayer, Ho'oponopono, which is so simple, where you just say, thank you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I love you. And when I just use that prayer again and again, what it's doing is pulling me back into the authentic me, the soul me, the bigger me, which is not in fear, concern or worry for that situation. It's trusting in the unfolding of divine order and divine synchronicity for it to be however it will be and not to anticipate the outcome, but to be in the divineness of the outcome and when I can put myself into that place that's where all the concerns dissipate and then if I create from a place where this spirit bring me what it is that I need to have or bring me something better than what I can even imagine 
then it opens me up to what I can't even contemplate is going to come. So not so much rituals or tools, but it's a, it's a way of being that continues to expand, especially with Cryon now having us go into what's called the Circle of Twelve, where Cryon's really guiding you to get in touch with that magnificent peace within you, which we've never been taught we can do. We've never been taught we can touch our soul and get into our soul. And what's our soul? Our soul is overlapped with everybody else's soul. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being part of this divine creation that was already known by our soul overlay before we even came onto the show. It was already known. We just had to show up. Oh, I love so, that. Thank yeah. you. That's super beautiful. Yeah, thank well, you. Um, <laughs> I'll have what she's having. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what she has just described is a part of, part of what used to be practicing and a little bit of ritual and that kind of has become automatic. And for me, there's still one thing I do besides everything else. I believe in gratitude. And the, um, the very things that she spoke of, I'm doing as well. But I start my day when my feet hit the floor. When I swing them over and they're on the ground, out of bed, I find something to give gratitude for. And I do it every single day of my life. And when there's one thing to give gratitude for, it always follows by three or four or five others that I can think of for myself. And so that first few moments of my day always starts with gratitude. And I think that has helped me a great deal to relax into whatever happens because mm -hmm. I realize that in what I do in life, there's a lot of variables, a lot of moving parts. And, of course, you could, you could uh, be uh, swept up in the fact that they're not all moving correctly. <laughs> and, those, and, and I just stop worrying about it because I'm so grateful. And that has changed everything for me. And that's how, that's been, I've been doing that for some time now. So that's, that's where this is for me. Excellent. Um, just to remind folks to find out more about Lee, about Monica, about Cryon, you can go to cryonmasters.com and it's K-R-Y-O-N masters.com. And the last question, my dears, this is Dare to Dream. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, that's a good question. I'd love to hear what Lee's are. More of the same. <laughs> More of the same. I will, um, at, by now, if there is a major shift in what I'm supposed to do, the old me went, don't change anything. I got it figured out. Don't change it. <clears throat> the new me says, bring it on. Because whatever it is, it'll be better. Whatever it is will be perfect. Mm. And I know that it'll be correct. So for me, I don't, I have no expectations except wow. more of the same. Wow. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. mm. What do you dare to dream, Monica? Well, I think <laughs> what I'm daring to dream is to show up in a more authentic way. I am so blessed that at this stage of my life, I am continuing to meet people on Healing Wednesday, people like yourself, who are just like sparks of light that inspire me to do more and be more. And so that is my dare to dream, is to keep meeting sparks of light that will help illuminate my flame even brighter. Thank you both so much for coming on the show. This has been um, just a such a warm and wonderful and wise connection. I'm really grateful. Mm. Well, we feel equally blessed right back at you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And I end today's show with this quote, the same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg. It's what you're made of, not the circumstances. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. And next week on the show, I have a guest returning, the Japanese maverick, Ken Honda. His books have sold over 7 million copies. He's known worldwide for teaching spirituality and finances and healing people around money 
Ken offers the Happy Money Healing Program. He is a crowd pleaser. So you'll want to join us for his return to the show and an update on all that is happening around money, finances, and what you can do about it. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you will take the wisdom that you heard today. One of the very many, you were designed to be 900 years. You were designed to be love. Let yourselves activate, do the things that will help get you in alignment so you can be healthy and be the light you came here to be.